Welcome back again, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here for you, still, this time with part three in our multi-episode series covering the history of the Jewish refugees in China during the first half of the 20th century. We left off last time at the end of 1937, beginning in 1938, with yellow lights flashing 24 hours a day for the Jews of Europe who were caught up in Hitler's continental ambitions, even though much worse days lie ahead. Jewish families, parents, grandparents, and children were already being traumatized in their daily life by all the consequences of having their comfortable and familiar life torn out by the roots. And over in Shanghai and all the other major towns and cities along the Yangtze River, Chinese locals were getting brutalized by the Japanese military. As with the European Jews, there was very little these Chinese civilians can do to defend themselves against their antagonizers. And in both cases, no one was rushing to the front of the line to help them out in this hour of need. Jews and Chinese often speak of their shared suffering. And this was one of those times. More than half a million in Germany, a couple hundred thousand in Austria, plus Romania, Hungary, Poland. That's a lot of Jews. And many of them had the same idea. Better get out before it gets any worse. A lot of them headed to Palestine, which didn't go down too well with the Arab majority already there. And the world's wealthiest nations were looking at each other, waiting to see who was going to do something about this, this Jewish problem, as it came to be known. And to deal with this Jewish problem, a conference was convened at the instigation of FDR in Avion, France, between July 6th and July 15th, 1938. 32 countries got together and tried to hash things out about taking in some of these great numbers of refugees and upping their quotas. There was plenty of discussion and argument about how to deal with this matter before them, but when the Avion Conference concluded, only the Dominican Republic, birthplace of Roberto Clemente, only they stepped up and said they'll take 100,000 Jewish refugees. Everyone else including the United States, sat on their hands. Despite this urgent spike in demand, there would be no changes to the existing quotas, they said. Oh boy, Hitler had a field day with that one. Nazi propagandists jumped all over those results of the Avian Conference that seemed to validate their claims that no one wanted these Jewish criminals. Well, that slammed the door shut on a lot of people's plans. You know, getting a visa to the United States was like winning the Powerball. But there were plenty of other places these German and Austrian Jews were happy to go to. Many went to France, but you know how that turned out later on. A lot got out, and like the Chinese who left China in hard times, these Jews dispersed themselves all over the world. As so many began exploring their options, to add further misery to the plight of the European Jews, for the sake of peace in our time, September 30th, 1938, Germany acquired the Sudetenland, the Germanish part of Czechoslovakia, which added another 120,000 Jews to the list of stateless persons desperately looking for a way out. So you can see why, under these circumstances, why people paid attention to these rumors that got out about Shanghai as a potential place of refuge. It said the rumors about Shanghai started in Vienna and spread from there. After a great deal of reflection, no doubt, many a Jewish adult figured, well, as bad as it was, as terrifying as the newsreels made it look, with all the bombed-out buildings and streets, there were already plenty of Jews living in Shanghai, including more than 6,000 from Russia, who had ended up there over the past few decades under... Similar circumstances that the European Jews now faced. So given the Hobson's choice they were left with, the idea started to catch fire. And though not everyone acted on it, if worst came to worst, a lot of Jews kept this Shanghai option in the back of their mind. It's 80 years ago this year, November 9th, 1938. Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. This was the terrible night of destruction and brutality when the Nazis declared it open season on the Jews. 
If you saw Schindler's List, you probably remember that scene very well. Following this terrifying event, if there were any doubting Thomases among the German and Austrian Jews who thought they could ride this, this Hitler thing out, Kristallnacht made everyone a believer. This is when the stream of Jews sailing to Shanghai turned into a torrent. And matters that before were merely urgent now became matters of life and death. All the available options, as unpalatable as they were back in 1935, 36, and 37, were now no longer available as options. And with the results of the Avion Conference turning out the way they did, and later on with the Great Revolt in Palestine that led to Britain closing the door there, the situation was looking grim, and Hitler's vice was getting tighter. As this drama was unfolding, 1938-1939, there were, as I mentioned, about 6,000 Russian Jews already in Shanghai who had come during the second wave of refugees discussed last episode, and who were mostly concentrated in the French concession. Though tragedy and hard times was common for many of these stateless Russians, they had still carved out a wonderful life for themselves in Shanghai. We sort of touched on that world in that Whitey Smith episode, CHP 193. Now, besides the Russian Jews, and plenty of white Russians too, don't forget, there were only about 500 German Jews and about a eh, thousand Baghdadi Jews in Shanghai. And those two groups lived mostly inside the international settlement. The number of Jews was still such that you didn't really notice them on the streets of Shanghai yet. That's all going to change come 1939. After Kristallnacht, they started to come. And by the time these Jews arrived in Shanghai, they were carrying nothing except the clothes they were wearing and a handbag with a few possessions. With so many Jews all in one place and all desperate to get out of Europe at the same time, eh, the Nazis came up with a scheme whereby, if you wanted to leave, you couldn't be carrying more than 10 German marks. That's it. No valuables, no nothing. 10 marks. Whatever else you had squirreled away, they confiscated it. And the catch was that the Shanghai authorities later on will say, look, you can't come here anymore unless you have at least $400 per person. So it was one of those kind of things. But 1,374 Jews managed to make their way to Shanghai in 1938, but nobody was making it easy for them. The following year, 1939, another 12,000 or more will try and squeeze in, and they'll be the worst off of all those who chose the Shanghai option. You're probably thinking, Jesus was so terrible what was happening in Europe with the Jews. Why not just book passage somewhere and get out? Well, here was the rub. Jews were all welcome to leave. I mean, since Hitler came to power in 1933, the Jews had gotten the hint and were encouraged to get the hell out of Germany. Some left. Most didn't. And now, in this desperate hour, they had to find a way out in a hurry. All you needed was an exit visa. No, you couldn't just leave. In order to board that plane, or vessel, or train, or even to book a ticket for overseas passage to anywhere, if you were trying to get out of the country, you needed an exit visa first. Permission to leave. And in order to get that exit visa, you had to show proof that someone was taking you in somewhere else. Over the next several years, for untold numbers, there's going to be a lot of waiting in queues for permits and for documents to be stamped. Pieces of paper that meant life or death to a family. Many waited in vain, waiting for their turn to get to the front of the line before time ran out on them. I'm going to introduce a couple people in this series who stepped up for the Jews. You're all familiar with Oscar Schindler and... Raoul Wallenberg, who have been particularly recognized for their efforts in saving the lives of so many Jews. Schindler, by the way, was running his uh, enamelware factory up in Poland uh, in 1939. So all this drama we're talking about now was all concurrent with that time. As far as noted angels who showed up for Europe's Jews, let me first introduce He Feng Shan. He was an amazing man, a lifelong Lutheran. He was fluent in English and German. He was a Chinese diplomat posted to the consulate in Vienna in 1937. 
and served as consul general. Now, after Anschluss, all embassies in Vienna were downgraded to consulates. So then, right after Kristallnacht, when everything reached peak urgency, Austrian Jews started knocking on the door of every consulate in Vienna, looking for visas and getting turned down wherever they went. Then word got out that at the Chinese consulate, the consul general was issuing visas that allowed you safe passage to Shanghai. You see, like I said, Shanghai by this time was up for grabs. 1938 and into 1939, still nobody checking passports. The Japanese, British, Germans, Chiang Kai-shek, the rival Wang Jingwei China government, the French, they all had bigger fish to fry. So really, all you had to do was get there. And then once you got to Shanghai, well, as long as you had the means, you could pretty much find passage to almost any place in the world. At this urgent hour, most Jewish refugees simply needed to get out of Europe first before they started planning step two, you know, what to do as soon as they got to Shanghai. And these post-Kristallnacht Jews, by the time they ran the gauntlet of every law and regulation that targeted them as they made their way to the exits. They were lucky to get out of Europe alive, let alone with any possessions or hidden diamonds or gold. So word got out in Vienna that the Chinese consulate was the place to go. And in the immediate aftermath of Kristallnacht, He Fengshan issued, it's estimated, anywhere from two to 4,000 visas to these Austrian Jews desperately looking for a place to go. Now, not everyone took He up on the notion of finding refuge in China. If they just had that piece of paper issued by him, that was good enough to get out of Austria. Thanks to He Fengshan's humanity, these people got safe passage to Shanghai and elsewhere and got to miss out on the Holocaust. Families who obtained these visas were also able to use them to get transit to other places in the world. There are, there are stories about He Fengshan's personal involvement in making sure every applicant got taken care of. There were stories of Jews dropping their passports in the window of his car as he drove down the street or stuffing them in his mailbox at his residence. They saw what was happening, and when no one else was willing to step up, he took matters into his own hand. And so, over the orders of his superior, Ambassador Chen Jie in Berlin, he still went ahead and issued these visas. Ambassador Chen wasn't looking to piss off the Nazis, so he tried to get He Fengshan to cool it with the China visas. The Germans, of course, found out what he was up to, and the consulate ended up getting shut down. And today, this former consulate building, it's the Vienna Ritz-Carlton, but He Fengshan continued issuing these life-saving visas from his apartment in Vienna until he got recalled back to China in May of 1940. It was said he was still issuing these China visas up until his last day. After the war, He Fengshan ended up having a bittersweet diplomatic career in the service of the Republic of China government. He lived to a ripe old age, dying in his 96th year in San Francisco. All the lives of these Austrian Jews he saved... He never mentioned it to anyone and kept that under his hat his whole life. He never once said, hey, look what I did. It was only after his passing that his daughter stumbled onto the secret and his papers and whatnot. And the world only got to find out about He Fengshan in 1997 when his obituary mentioned the deeds he had done back in Vienna. How many lives did He Fengshan save? Thousands for sure. Eh, whatever it was, a thousand, five thousand. The Talmud says, whoever saves a life of Israel, it is considered as if he saved an entire world. In 2001, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Authority in Israel, after discovering his story, declared He Fengshan righteous among nations, same as Oscar Schindler. And though more people know of Schindler from the Spielberg movie, I encourage you to please also never forget about the Chinese Schindler, as he's now known, He Fengshan. In 2007, a decade after his passing, he was given honorary citizenship in Israel. And here in the beautiful country, in 2008, 
Senator Orrin Hatch sponsored Resolution 588 that honored his deeds and called him, quote, a man of great courage and humanity who saved the lives of thousands of Austrian Jews between 1938 and 1940. In 1939, the extent of the persecution suffered by Jews wasn't common knowledge yet. Therefore, any outpouring of sympathy and regret felt for Europe's Jews had yet to materialize. The concentration camps were still unknown. Nobody was feeling sorry for any European Jews. And this impacted the attitudes of the people and the municipal authorities in Shanghai who had to deal with them. The greatest influx of Jews into Shanghai happened May, June, July, and August of 1939. These four months in particular were causing alarm bells to ring all throughout the halls of power in Shanghai. By then, too many Jewish refugees had landed in Shanghai and they went straight to the international settlement to build a nest. And this had upset the entire ecosystem there that was already reeling from the after effects of the Battle of Shanghai, end of 1937. The French, too, were also trying not to get overwhelmed in their concession by the situation. I didn't mention this, but the French government, they helped out a lot of Jews. A lot made it to Shanghai, departing from the port of Marseille and arriving via Saigon. The Japanese, too, saw the Jewish refugees pouring into their little part of Shanghai in Hong Kong. It was a lot cheaper to live in Hong Kong than in the international settlement. So for those Jews living on a budget... This was the preferred area to go to. As for the Shanghai Municipal Council, the highest body administering the city, they were in over their heads, and the desperation over what to do led a lot of people at the top to harden their hearts and discuss the most drastic measures to deal with the problem. Loophole by loophole, new regulation by new regulation, by the end of 1939, They began to make it harder and harder for these Jews to find refuge in Shanghai. By mid-1940, they almost succeeded. The torrent was back down to a trickle. And with everyone arriving as destitute as they were, someone had to think fast on their feet to come up with a way to help these people and keep them from starving to death. Leaders of the Jewish communities rose to the fore, and in October 1938, the Committee for Assistance of European Jewish Refugees, was established. It became known as the Spielman Committee, after its main organizer, financier Michael Spielman. Beth Aharon Synagogue, Silas Aaron Hardoon's gift to the Shanghai Sephardic Jewish community in 1927, became a reception center and makeshift soup kitchen. This organization was a joint effort by both the Sephardic and Ashkenazi communities, and there were others. The oldest relief group was the Hilsfahn für Deutsche Juden, set up in 1914. It was already in place and provided a ready safety net for the first Austrian Jews who came after the Anschluss when Germany annexed uh, Austria. The other major organization that contributed to keeping the Jewish refugee community afloat was formed around another giant in this struggle for survival. This was Paul Komar. He was a Hungarian Jew and a long-timer in Shanghai, having first arrived in 1898. In August 1938, he helped set up the International Committee for Granting Relief to European Refugees. This committee uh, became known as the Komar Committee, and they cooperated very closely with the Shanghai municipal authorities to work out any issues that came up. And they also helped to keep tabs on all the Jews and made sure everyone was duly registered and in compliance with whatever laws and regulations there were. They used to call these papers that the Jews had to carry Komarpasses in uh, German. You know, after you get past the headlining stars of this period, the Sassoons, Kadoris, and Hardoons, next level down were a lot of people you probably never heard of, but who were movers and shakers throughout this ordeal. Michael Spielman and Paul Comer were among them. And all these people, Baghdadi Jews, Russian Jews, European Jews, everyone who had the means 
banded together to build an entire support infrastructure and to get it funded very quickly. Initially, a nice chunk of the financing to keep the soup kitchens running and make sure these refugees had a roof over their head came courtesy of Sir Victor Sassoon. Now, most of you know of him as the guy who built the Peace Hotel. He was an early investor in Shanghai real estate and owned about 1,800 properties all over the city and on the Bund. He lived quite a privileged and fascinating life and got to enjoy a lot of fine things. He was called the J.P. Morgan of the Orient. Loved horse racing. Quite a man in his time. Anyway, Sir Victor Sassoon was one of the major pillars that supported the whole Shanghai Jewish community throughout the early part of the ordeal. Horace and Lawrence Kadori initially worked for Sir Victor Sassoon. They were the sons of Sir Eli Kadori, the family patriarch. The Kadori family would later become one of the first families of Hong Kong and go on to magnificent things there. But in this hour of need, the Kadoris were another financial pillar in Shanghai that held everything up. Lawrence Kadori, by the way, he too had an interesting nickname, the Asian Rockefeller. Ah, the Yanks, gotta love them. And as rich and resourceful as all these Baghdadi Jews were, these elites among the Jews, these early arrivals who were long present in Shanghai before these Ashkenazi European and Russian Jews started showing up, by 1938, and certainly into 1939, even they, with all their money, couldn't keep financing the relief effort on their own. Outside help was needed. This is where the JDC enters the picture. The JDC was the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. Nice no-nonsense name. It was referred to as the Joint. A lot of American money was raised by concerned Jews and other charities, and the JDC was the organization that was responsible for writing the checks and making sure the money got to where it was supposed to go. And then people who worked for the JDC on the other end made sure it got dispersed as needed. For 1938, it was a good enough system. And looking back at how primitive everything was back then compared to now, as far as international banking, communication, logistics, it's truly a wonder how everything got done. They had some very resourceful and determined people, many unsung heroes who didn't get written into too many history books, who worked in the trenches and behind the scenes to make sure thousands of Jewish families got at least a, a hunk of bread, a boiled potato, and enough soup to keep them going for another day until the next feeding. Until the Japanese shut them down after Pearl Harbor, the JDC was the lifeline for many a Jewish refugee living on the edge. The first Jewish refugee camp opened in January 1939. Four more would be opened as the numbers swelled. Two hospitals were built as well as a school. 10,000 meals a day were served up until the hard times hit. You see, as bad as it was, as much as people were suffering in 1939 and into 1940, they'd be calling these the good old days before long, especially after December 7, 1941. Horace Kadori and Brother Lawrence, in 1937, had set up the Shanghai Jewish Youth Association, which became like uh, the local JCC and so much more. It funded schools and training centers and provided all kinds of activities for all the Jews who had been born in Shanghai and who had suddenly found themselves there. The more enterprising among these Jewish refugees, who had been stripped of every fennig they had and all their valuables, as soon as some of them docked in Shanghai, after they were processed and assigned lodging, they would immediately go scout out locations to open a business along Huashan or Zhoushan roads. Not, not everyone hustled, but those who did they had no trouble at first finding a way to feed themselves and their family. If you were smart and you had a skill, or if you were a physician or dentist you wouldn't have too many problems getting by. But if you weren't the go-getter type, or if your days were spent studying the Talmud, eh, the soup kitchen kept everyone fed. Oh, and one other thing. No matter if you were kosher or not, the soup kitchens only served up kosher meals, as meager as they were. I saw a, um, a video on YouTube. Actually, I saw so many. YouTube is inundated with so much material about this period. 
and I encourage anyone interested to dig a little deeper to go check this treasure trove out. But there was one video I remember. They were interviewing this 93-year-old man. Well, 93 at the time the video was taken. And he was bedridden and in a hospital or a senior facility. And he was asked about his memories of the Jews. And he said, quote, The Jewish people did business in Shanghai. Some were tailors, some were working as carpenters, some were bricklayers, and some were barbers. They would hang a sign around their neck with their business on it. And they were really hardworking and thrifty, and they did all kinds of businesses. Chinese did their businesses, and the Jewish people did theirs. They didn't bother each other. End quote. Let me also mention, around this time, 1938-39, Adolf Eichmann and a couple other Nazi biggies tried to carry out this plan that called for mass deportation of German and Austrian Jews to Japan and China. Now, this was seriously considered, but in the end, logistically not feasible, and worst of all, very expensive. So that never happened. Besides all that, the Japanese weren't too hot on the idea. The Germans, since 1933, had really tried everything as far as shooing the Jews out of the fatherland and anywhere else they controlled. But the problem was bigger and more expensive to resolve than thought. And that's why, in October of 1941, the Nazis will give up on trying to incentivize the Jews to leave and change to a more sinister and deadly methodology. I wanted to mention one more thing, another great footnote from this history, but I think I'm going to save it for next episode instead. Lots more action to hear about in 1939, but for now, we're going to put the bookmark in. I only paid for 30 minutes of recording time, and they're very, very strict here at Abbey Road Studios. If you weren't paying attention last time, I'm still using Himalaya. Nice podcast app if you're ready to throw in the towel in your present one. I was using Apple all these years. I got so fed up. Now I'm happy, once again, of the 150 or so podcasts that I subscribe to. I only listen to about 10% of them. Everything I listen to in regular rotation, it's all subscribed to now in Himalaya. No more getting flooded with all these shows that I'm saving for a rainy day. It never rains here in Southern California anyway. It's got a real nice and clean interface, easy to use, free too. It's fast becoming the official podcast app of the China History Podcast. Go download it in the Google or Apple stores, with my compliments. Himalaya. Hello, Gold Mountain. Getting closer. If you live anywhere near Musicville, USA, the city of Nashville, founded in 1779, you'll get a chance to see my favorite Guzheng performer and singer, Wu Fei, along with the talented and accomplished Mr. Shanir Ezra Blumenkrantz on the Ode, backed by Vanderbilt University's own Chatterbird Ensemble. They will debut Hello Gold Mountain, February 2019, at Ingram Hall. Hello Gold Mountain, a requiem for lost possibilities of the Jewish community of Shanghai. This original composition for chamber orchestra, the finishing touches of which Wu Fei is working on as we speak, was inspired by the actual stories of those Jewish refugees who escaped to Shanghai during World War II. I might fly in on the Teacup Media private jet for that performance. HelloGoldMountain.com for more info. Okay, that's it for this time. Laszlo Montgomery here, signing off from Los Angeles, California, imploring you, as I always do, to consider coming back next time, a mere two weeks away for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.